Section 1 of The Importance of the Gospel Ministry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Importance of the Gospel Ministry by Samuel Miller. Reverend and dear sir, at a meeting of the Society for Inquiry on Missions, composed of the students of the Theological Seminary, held on Saturday, the 1st of December, it was on motion unanimously resolved that the committee whose business it is to superintend the publications of this society request for publication a copy of your lecture delivered before the students of this seminary at the opening of the present session. In resolving to make this request, the society were prompted by the conviction that it will be found highly acceptable and useful not only to those who are already set for the defense of the gospel, but to all who shall aspire to this responsible office, and instrumentally through them to the great body of the church. With sentiments of high esteem, we remain respectfully yours, H. Hooker, J. K. Cunningham, D. T. Wood, Committee, Princeton, December 9th, 1827, Reverend Dr. Miller. End of section 1. Section 2 of The Importance of the Gospel Ministry by Samuel Miller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An introductory lecture, etc. Beloved candidates for the holy ministry, it is evident that ministers of religion must have been coeval with the first acts of social worship. Long before the institution of the Levitical priesthood, there were undoubtedly persons who ministered in holy things, that is, who presided in offering sacrifices and in conducting the exercise of public instruction and devotion. Even among the antediluvians we read of those who preached and prophesied in the name of the Lord, and after the flood, before the commencement of the Mosaic dispensation, we find mention made of Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High God, and also of Jethro, a priest of Midian, who was evidently a worshipper of Jehovah. After the establishment of the Aaronic priesthood, the line was more distinctly drawn than ever between the ministers at the altar and those in whose behalf they ministered. New barriers were raised against all unauthorized intrusion on the appropriate duties of the priestly office, and weighty and most momentous was the trust committed to those who bore that office. When the New Testament church was organized, the same general feature was impressed on this more spiritual dispensation. Still a class of men was set apart for the service of the sanctuary, and their essential functions, as before, appropriated to them alone. In several respects, indeed, did the ceremonial priesthood differ from the New Testament ministry. The latter were no longer confined to a single family. They were no longer called priests, but ministers, servants, stewards of the mysteries of God, ambassadors of Christ, etc. They were no longer distributed into several orders, and a variety of ceremonial observances relating to their qualifications, investiture, and succession ceased to be obligatory. Mr. Gibbon, indeed, asserts that the distinction between clergy and laity was unknown in the primitive church and was not introduced until the second century. If by this assertion he meant that we do not find these precise terms to distinguish between ecclesiastical men and others in familiar use in any Christian writings earlier than those of Tertullian, Origen, and Cyprian, and especially that the proud and arrogant claims with which one of these terms was afterwards connected were, before their time, in a great measure unknown, he is probably correct. But if his meaning be that the Christian ministry is not an institution of Jesus Christ, that he did not from the beginning annex to it a specific spiritual authority, that ministers were not from the very origin of the church designated by appropriate titles, and that there were not appropriate functions assigned to them, and that these functions were not in the primitive church confined to them, but were common to all Christians, if this be his meaning, there could hardly be a statement more palpably erroneous, a statement more unequivocally contradicted by the New Testament itself, and all the most authentic records of early antiquity. And as the office of which we speak has, either substantially or formally, existed in all ages, so its object has been ever the same, not to establish a set of lords over God's heritage, nor to form a privileged order in the community, not to exercise a spiritual despotism over the understandings and consciences of men, not even to supersede the attention of men to their own spiritual interests, but to stimulate, to guide, and in various ways to assist them in this attention. Every private individual, indeed, is, of course, responsible for his own moral character. Every one who comes within the reach of the gospel is to inquire, to believe, and to obey for himself, and for himself to receive the rewards of his deeds. 
and if he neglect his duty, no diligence on the part of others can avail him. Yet at the same time, every minister of religion is no less responsible for all the instructions which he gives, and for all his fidelity, or the want of it, in leading those around him into the way of truth and salvation. And if any perish through his unfaithfulness, their blood will be required at his hands. My object, my beloved young friends, in the present address is to call your attention to the unspeakable importance of the sacred office to which you aspire, to show that the character of those who bear it is vitally interesting to the Church of God, that whenever the Church is extended and built up, ministers are instrumental in conferring the blessing, that whenever she is corrupted and degraded, ministers are the guilty agents in accomplishing the mischief, and in short, that what ministers are, the Church will always be. This... I have no doubt will appear if we consider, first, the great design of the office itself. The importance of any institution is plainly to be measured by the objects which it is intended to promote, by the purposes which it is appointed and adapted to accomplish. Estimated by this standard, the importance of the gospel ministry is literally infinite. What is its great design? It is nothing less than to publish, explain, and recommend the religion of Jesus Christ, to proclaim its glad tidings, and to extend its holy reign. But, is this religion of any real value to mankind? Is it of any importance that the children of men be instructed in the way of salvation, that they be brought under the genuine power of the gospel, that their sins be pardoned, that their hearts be sanctified, that their evil habits be subdued, that their unhallowed affections and lusts be crucified, and that they be prepared for every holy duty and enjoyment, here and for eternal blessedness hereafter? Nothing can be plainer than that these are matters in comparison with which all the temporal interests of men are as the small dust of the balance weighed against the everlasting mountains. Yet these are the great matters about which ministers of the gospel are primarily and constantly conversant. The grand object of their commission is to turn men from darkness to light, from Satan to God, from pollution, condemnation, and misery, to purity, pardon, and happiness, and finally to the enjoyment of an incorruptible crown, an undefiled inheritance, an exceeding and eternal weight of glory in the heavens. It might be supposed, indeed, that a system so pure, reasonable, and glorious as the gospel of Jesus Christ, when once made known, would always be found to work its own way in the world, without the efforts of the living teacher to urge it on the attention and the consciences of men. But the word of God gives us no warrant to expect such a result, and all experience is equally against it. The carnal mind is enmity against God. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, so that, left to himself, no one would embrace or obey the gospel. To say nothing, therefore, of the unnumbered millions of our world's population— who have never heard the gospel, and who can never be expected to hear it without preachers, ministers may be said to be indispensable for maintaining the power of the gospel, even where it is already established. To keep alive religion in the world, to prevent Christian knowledge, public worship, the Sabbath, and the various ordinances of social piety from utterly perishing among men, in short, to preserve those who have enjoyed Christianity from relapsing into real heathenism, it is necessary that ministers of religion be constantly employed to rouse men to a sense of their condition. It is necessary not only that the people be furnished with the written word, but also with the living teacher, who shall, from Sabbath to Sabbath, and from house to house, bring their minds, if I may so express it, into contact with that word, and constrain them to give it their serious and practical attention. It is necessary that they be called together, instructed, warned, entreated, conjured again and again, day by day, to attend to the things which belong to their peace. For nearly eighteen centuries the standing means both of maintaining and extending the knowledge of Christ and his salvation in the world has been the preaching of the gospel, and without the use of this divine ordinance still we have no reason to expect either that sinners will be converted or saints edified and comforted. It is not, of course, meant to be intimated either that no conversion is ever effected but by means of the authorized ministry, or that this ministry is ever made effectual by any virtue or power of its own, but the position meant to be maintained is that God in his sovereign wisdom hath appointed and promised by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, that consequently, on the one hand, where the gospel is not preached, we have no reason to expect that the work of conversion and salvation will, to any extent, go forward and that, on the other, where it is faithfully and ably dispensed, it will generally be accompanied, in a greater or less degree, with a sanctifying and saving power. 
Now, if these things be so, then it follows that the best interests of the community, and especially the vital interests of the Church of God, her orthodoxy, purity, life, peace, and enlargement, may be said to be suspended on the character of her ministry. Where there are no ministers, it is obvious that there can be no church, no organized, visible Christianity. And where there is an existing ministry, it is equally evident that the church must, from the nature of things, bear the same character with those who are appointed medium for the conveying to her the element on which she lives, and the principles by which she is guided. If men be either not instructed at all, or taught erroneously, the consequences may be equally fatal. If the blind lead the blind, we know what infinite wisdom hath told us will ensue. None under the name of ministers can hope to be instrumental in promoting the true welfare of men, but those who have both the ability and the disposition to lead them in the right way. If they be generally enlightened, fervently pious, and really faithful, not only in preaching the pure gospel, but also in the discharge of all their public and private duties, true religion, both in principle and practice, will be extensively understood, valued, and prevalent, but if, on the contrary, they be, as a body, ignorant, unfaithful, erroneous in doctrine, or corrupt in practice, if they be proud, ambitious, worldly-minded, contentious, and negligent of the best interests of men, real religion will as certainly be despised and decline, as any necessary effect will result from the presence of its cause. Nay, only let ministers be indolent and forgetful of the great end and duties of their office, and spiritual desolation and death will as assuredly reign around them as darkness will ensue in the absence of the solar rays. In short, if human nature be such as the Bible represents it, earthly, sensual, proud, selfish, and backward to all that is spiritually good, if no other remedy than that which the gospel furnishes be either adapted or effectual to the healing of our moral disease, and if all scripture and all experience teach us that this remedy cannot be expected to display its healing power, any further than it is unremittingly exhibited and applied by those who are appointed to execute this holy and benevolent office, then nothing can be plainer than that, if they be essentially deficient either in orthodoxy, skill, or fidelity, the moral pestilence which they are commissioned to cure must rage with uncontrolled fury. It would require a constant cause of miracles to prevent consequences the most disastrous from covering the face of society. When we consider, moreover, that the public preaching of the gospel is almost the only means of instruction in morals and religion which a large portion of mankind enjoy, when we reflect that the minds of men, if not occupied with truth and holiness, will be unavoidably occupied with falsehood, with superstition, and with numberless forms of corruption, and when we remember, too, that the eyes of all, enemies as well as friends, are habitually turned towards ministers of religion, either for the purpose of imitating their example or of deriving from their delinquencies encouragement in infidelity and sin, when these things are considered, surely it is not easy to overrate the importance of the sacred office to all the best interests of the church and of mankind. Surely it is of unspeakable, yea, of infinite moment, that the man who undertakes to instruct his fellow men in the things of God and salvation, who is, as it were, their mouth in speaking to God and the mouth of God in speaking to them, who dispenses the sacraments to them and their children, who administers instruction and consolation to the sick and the dying, who undertakes in a word to be the teacher, the counsellor, and the guide of his fellow sinners in seeking temporal and eternal happiness. Surely it is of infinite importance that he who is charged with these high duties should be wise, holy, faithful, diligent, self-denied, and exemplary. On his character and conduct, the interests of eternity as well as of time are every hour suspended. A minister of religion cannot be a neutral or indifferent member of society. He will be a blessing or a curse wherever he is, and a blessing or a curse in most cases proportioned to the degree in which he is pious and faithful, or the reverse. End of section 2 Section 3 of The Importance of the Gospel Ministry by Samuel Miller this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second, let us next attend to some of the statements of Scripture on this subject. These correspond most perfectly with the foregoing representations, importing that when the spiritual guides of the people are wise and faithful, the church is always blessed, and that when they are ignorant, selfish, and corrupt, she never fails to suffer and generally in direct proportion to the degree of their delinquency. On the one hand, faithful ministers are promised in Scripture as a great blessing and their labors represented as a pledge of rich benefits, both temporal and spiritual. I will give you pastors, saith Jehovah by the prophet, 
after mine own heart, who shall feed you with knowledge and with understanding. And again by the same prophet, I will set shepherds over them, which shall feed them. And what is represented as the consequence to those who are thus fed? They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. And again the great head of the church in describing that period when Zion shall eminently flourish says, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. And concerning that period he adds, Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, that is, my delight is in her, and thy land Belua, that is, married, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. On the other hand, the unfaithfulness of ministers is everywhere represented in Scripture not only as an aggravated sin, but also as a source of incalculable injury to the church and to all the interests of social order. The following specimen of inspired language on this subject is of the most decisive character. Thus saith the Lord, the pastors are become brutish, and have not sought the Lord, therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets, for both prophet and priest are profane. They walk in lies, they strengthen the hands of evildoers, so that none doth return from his wickedness. Thus saith the Lord from the prophets, is profaneness gone forth into all the land. If they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from the evil of their doings. But they have caused my people to forget my name. Therefore I am against the prophets, saith the Lord. Pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed their flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fat, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased ye have not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Hear this, O ye priests, and hearken, for judgment is toward you, because ye have been a snare on Mizpah, and a net spread upon Tabor. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest unto me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. They shall be like people, like priest, and I will punish them for their ways, and reward them for their doings. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirits and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because they have spoken vanity and seen lies. Therefore, behold, I am against them, saith the Lord God. Because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, peace, when there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Therefore, I will break down the wall, and it shall fall, and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. O ye priests, ye have departed out of the way, ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Therefore have I made you contemptible before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways. It were easy to fill many pages with quotations from the Old Testament which speak in a similar strain, and the same language is continued in the New Testament. There we read of false teachers, of teachers reprobate concerning the truth, of men who by their false doctrines and unhallowed practices overthrew the faith of those around them, of men who sought their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ's. And we are assured that such not only brought upon themselves swift destruction, but that many followed their pernicious ways, and that on their account the way of truth was evil spoken of. In short, in every part of Scripture we find error in doctrine and corruption in practice in the Church, uniformly traced to the ignorance, unfaithfulness, or profligacy of those whose office and whose duty it was to have been teachers and guides of the people. The language before quoted of the inspired prophet, like people, like priests, may be considered as an epitome of all the scriptural statements on this subject. End of section 3《Section 4 of the Importance of the Gospel Ministry by Samuel Miller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Third, the great principle which it is my present object to establish is further confirmed by all the analogies and facts which pervade every species of society. In the family circle, if the parents, the natural instructors and guides of youth, be ignorant, unprincipled, profane or profligate, who does not expect, as a matter of course, to find the children walking in the same steps of ignorance, pollution and shame? And if they be found to possess the opposite character, who does not regard it as a kind of moral miracle? Nay, in the estimation of the wise, it is not necessary that a parent be profligate in order to be a curse to his children. Such is the tendency of human nature to sink down into darkness and ruin, that indolence alone on his part may effectually destroy them. Only let him entirely neglect their intellectual and moral culture, and he will probably train them up to be miserable vagabonds, a disgrace to himself and the pests of society. In like manner, in a seminary of learning, do we not always find the attainments and character of the taught to bear a distinct proportion to those of the teachers? If those who occupy the place of instructors be grossly defective either in scholarship or diligence, who can reasonably suppose that they will succeed in the propagation of sound knowledge? If preceptors be ignorant, it was strange indeed to find their pupils well instructed. If those who are employed to cultivate the minds and form the habits of the young be incompetent to the discharge of their duties and set an unworthy example, how can learning and virtue and order be expected to reign among those committed to their care? As well might we expect darkness to beget light or vice to propagate virtue. And if the degeneracy should become so widespread as that the whole body of literary teachers in a country at the same time should be unqualified and unfaithful, would not the general interests of literature necessarily, and as a matter of course, be everywhere utterly degraded? If the fountains be corrupt, the streams surely cannot be pure and salutary. It is impossible. What the former are, the latter will ever be. The same principle applies to the civil community. Legislators and magistrates give law to those around them, not only by official enactments, but also by their example and by the incalculable power of their influence. When, therefore, they throw the whole weight of their example and influence, whatever may be their amount, into the scale of order, virtue, and true religion, the consequence is always happy. There never was an instance of this being thoroughly done by leading men as a body without giving a tone to public sentiment and practice of the most benign character. And on the contrary, there never was an instance of their generally taking an opposite course without producing effects of the most injurious kind on public morals and happiness. If it be true in every walk and connection of life that one sinner destroyeth much good, it is equally true that one truly pious and exemplary man produceth much good. But when that sinner or that pious man holds a conspicuous and influential place in society, who can set bounds to the good or the evil which he may or probably will occasion? Every additional degree of elevation which he holds, or of influence which he possesses, will render him a greater blessing or a heavier curse each day that he lives. In a word, as the general character of the rulers of a nation is, so will the nation itself certainly prove. But if this principle apply to every other class of rulers and leaders among men, much more essentially and solemnly does it apply to the ministers of the gospel, because the great interests entrusted to their official administration are infinitely more momentous than the highest of those which secular men, as such, can ever pursue, because in spiritual things we stand in more pressing need of stimulants and guidance and aid than in temporal pursuits, and because the consequences of the influence which ministers exert and of the impressions which they make not only affect this mortal life but stretch into eternity. The highest object which kings, emperors, and legislators ever propose to themselves in their fondest plans is the advancement of population, wealth, external tranquillity, and temporal happiness. None of them ever sought the sanctification of the human heart and the everlasting welfare of men as the ultimate end of their plans. But the great end of that kingdom which faithful ministers recommend and promote, while it includes many subordinate benefits, is moral and eternal blessedness. Of this kingdom alone it may be said that it is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And to him alone who is immediately instrumental in saving or destroying a soul, to the highest responsibilities attach of which man is capable. When other leading men in the community act their part, they will, no doubt, exert some degree of influence on the moral as well as the secular interests of men. But the activity of ministers of the gospel is primarily destined to affect, and to the whole extent of its influence does affect, the spiritual and eternal interest 
of all within the sphere of their ministrations. End of section 4. Section 5 of The Importance of the Gospel Ministry by Samuel Miller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I have only to add, fourth, that all these reasonings are abundantly confirmed by the voice of history. The direct declarations of Scripture on the general truth before us have been already considered. Its historical information is equally striking and decisive. Search the inspired history from beginning to end, and you shall find that just in proportion as ministers of religion were enlightened and holy, faithful and diligent, the purity and prosperity of the church were established. Whether during the patriarchal or mosaic dispensations, whether under judges or kings, it was ever the same. Whether the spiritual instructors or guides were sound and devoted men, religion in a considerable degree flourished, truth was maintained, idolatry was frowned upon, and order and happiness abounded. And whenever God, after long spiritual declension among his people, intended mercy for them and a happy revival in their bondage, we never find him accomplishing his purpose by miracle, but always by the use of human instruments, and generally by his commissioned servants. He seldom failed to raise up able and devoted men to enlighten, reform, and sanctify the people. But whenever the prevailing character of those who bore the sacred office became corrupt, a scene the sad reverse of all this was disclosed on every side. Truth and justice were trodden down in the streets, divine institutions were dishonoured, idolatry lifted its head, and public profligacy and misery followed in its train. This was so steadily the course of things throughout the whole of the Old Testament economy that to quote all the examples of it on record would be to repeat the greater part of the Jewish scriptures. On the one hand, the revivals of religion which occurred repeatedly under the auspices of faithful men raised up by God for the purpose in the time of the judges, and afterwards in the time of Ezra, of Nehemiah, and of the Asmonean witnesses of the truth, and, on the other hand, the pernicious influence of unsanctified teachers, from time to time, the conduct of Hophni and Phinehas, who, by their unworthy conduct, caused the people to despise the offerings of the Lord, the conduct of the sons of Samuel, who became sources of deep corruption and disaffection among the people, and the deplorable spirit, habits, and influence of the priests and scribes, before the captivity, after the captivity, and during our Lord's ministry on earth, all bear witness to the correctness of the principle which I am endeavouring to establish. When the New Testament church was set up under a more spiritual form, the ministers commissioned to go forth and preach the gospel with Paul at their head were men, we know, of a peculiarly devoted spirit. They were endowed not only with extraordinary gifts, but also with large measures of grace. They meddled not with the kingdoms of this world, they aspired to no earthly distinctions, they employed no carnal weapons, they undertook not to be judges or dividers among the people, but setting one object alone before them, the advancement of the kingdom of Christ, in all its simplicity and purity, they pursued that object with zeal, with indefatigable labor, and with unceasing prayer, day and night, giving themselves wholly to their work, shrinking from no privation, intimidated by no danger, counting all things but loss for the excellency of Christ." and not regarding even their lives as dear to them, so that they might finish their course with joy and the ministry which they had received of the Lord Jesus. How striking the delineation of the character and the narrative of the ministry of these holy men! What sacred elevation of sentiment and affection! What zeal! What humility! What disinterestedness! What abstraction from the pleasures and honors of the world! What devotedness to their master's glory and to the salvation of souls! What unwearied labor in preaching and instructing from house to house! What holiness of example in all manner of conversation! And what were the effects of the ministrations of such men? The most decisive and happy, the Lord followed their labors with an abundant blessing. More was done in the propagation of the genuine gospel during the first century than in any other from that period to the present hour. None of those devoted missionaries labored in vain. The word of the Lord had free course and was glorified much people were added to the Lord. As long as the ministers of Christ maintained this character, not all the wisdom of philosophy, falsely so called, not all the frowns of an anti-Christian government, nay, not all the terrors of martyrdom, could obstruct the course of the new and heaven-born system which they taught, though they were persecuted from city to city, persecuted in prison and to death, hated of all men, and their names cast forth as vile for the sake of the holy and gracious message which they proclaimed. Still, that message went on, conquering and to conquer. Great multitudes believed and were added to the Lord, both men and women. 
And the word of the Lord increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly, and great companies became obedient to the faith. And the churches had rest and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Nor was this the case merely in Judea, in Samaria, and in Galilee, but also in Syria, in Asia Minor, in Rome, in Greece, and, indeed, throughout the greater part of the known world. It is not denied, indeed, that in several of the churches of which we have accounts during the lives of these devoted ministers of Christ, we read of dissensions arising, of false doctrines being introduced, and of corrupt practices gaining ground. But while we admit that the apostles were not perfect, more than other men, and that, as long as human beings preach and administer the affairs of the church, some degree of imperfection may be expected to mark every work and society with which they are connected. Still, it may be confidently asserted that the difficulties and corruptions which arose in the apostolic churches were in no wise inconsistent with the doctrine which I maintain. For in every instance in which heresy, division, or immoral practices marked the character of any church in the apostles' days, it was evidently the work of weak or wicked ministers, of false apostles, Judaizing teachers, or men otherwise unsound and unfaithful, who, coming in, brought with them error, strife, and every evil work. I cannot recollect a single exception to this statement. Corrupt occupants of the sacred office, or miserable pretenders to that office, were always the authors of the mischief. In the second and third centuries we mark a gradual, but very distinct and melancholy decline, both in faith and practice, throughout the whole church, and when we carefully scrutinize the causes as well as the circumstances of this decline, it is impossible not to consider it as connected with a corresponding decline in the character of the clergy. When Justin Martyr, Clemens of Alexandria, and Origen, together with other ministers whose taste and character they became instrumental in perverting, had tarnished the simplicity and purity of the gospel, they opened the way for more mischief in the church of God than, with all their learning they were able to estimate, or with all their good intentions to counteract. The following strong picture from the pen of Cyprian will show that there was at that time clerical degeneracy enough to account for all the corruption in doctrine and practice which then existed, or which soon followed. Quote, A long continuance of peace and security had relaxed the rigor of that holy discipline which was delivered to us from above. The religion of the clergy slackened and decayed, the faith of priests and deacons grew languid and inactive. Works of charity were discontinued, and an universal license and corruption prevailed. Diverse bishops, who should have taught, both by their example and persuasion, neglecting their high trust and their commission from above, entered upon the management of secular affairs and leaving their seat and their charge with it, wandered about from place to place on mercantile business and in pursuit of disreputable gain. Thus the poor of the church were miserably neglected, while the bishops, who should have taken care of them, were intent upon nothing but their own private profit, which they were forward to advance at any rate, and by any, even the foulest methods." Origen speaks of the clergy of his day in language no less jointed and revolting. Quote, "'If Christ,' says he, "'justly wept over Jerusalem, he may now on much better grounds weep over the church, which was erected to the end that it might be an house of prayer, and yet,' through the filthy usury of some, and I wish that these were not even the pastors of the people, it is made a den of thieves. End quote. Eusebius, who lived in the next century, writes in the same strain concerning the age of Cyprian, quote, When, through too much liberty, we fell into sloth and negligence, when everyone began to envy and backbite another, when we waged, as it were, an intestine war amongst ourselves, with words as with swords, Pastors rushed against pastors, and people against people, and strife and tumult, deceit and guile advanced to the highest pitch of wickedness. Our pastors, despising the rule of religion, strove mutually with one another, studying nothing more than how to outdo each other in strife, emulations, hatred, and mutual enmity, proudly usurping principalities as so many places of tyrannical domination. Then the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger. End quote. If such were the character of the clergy in the days of Origen and Cyprian, we have surely no reason to wonder at the deep degeneracy, both in doctrine and morals, which all the records of that time show to have begun in every part of the church, and which prepared the way for the still deeper degeneracy which marked the succeeding age. The teachers and leaders of the church as a body were no longer faithful, and it would have been miraculous indeed if the church herself had remained pure and harmonious. 
In the fourth century, when Christianity became for the first time the established religion of the Roman Empire, both the causes and the symptoms of spiritual corruption became everywhere more prevalent and more strongly marked. And the first and most prominent fact which strikes us in the gloomy scene which followed is the degeneracy of the clergy. Christ's kingdom is not of this world. Of course, the moment the church becomes united with the civil government, under whatever form, she suffers a kind of spiritual prostitution, which is invariably productive of both pollution and degradation. When Constantine professed to be a convert to the religion of Christ, and he was probably never more than a mere worshipper in the outer court of the Christian temple, he immediately began to bestow upon its institutions and ministers all the splendor of imperial munificence. The emperor and his subordinate officers courted and flattered the clergy, and the clergy in their turn courted and flattered the great men of the empire, sought their smiles, accepted secular endowments with greediness, were found in places at court and became sycophants and tools of men in power. Their suppleness, luxury, unhallowed emulations, and consequent unfaithfulness led, as might have been expected, to a corresponding character among the body of visible Christians. Again, the Old Testament adage, like priests, like people, became unhappily and signally realized. The church exchanged the simplicity of truth and the beauty of holiness for the habiliments of secular splendor, and then set in that full tide of corruption in doctrine, order, and morals, which, after receiving one serious check in the time of Augustine, soon issued in the papal apostasy, and transformed the chaste virgin, as left by our Lord and his apostles, into the mother of harlots and abominations. During the Dark Ages, the general character of the clergy was such as we might suppose likely to produce, and be produced by the character of the church. Ignorant, voluptuous, ambitious, contentious, and profligate, as the great body of them were, to an almost incredible degree, they continually shared a baleful influence all around them, and instead of being teachers of truth and purity and guides to heaven, they became, everywhere, instructors in the most childish superstitions, panders to lust and ringleaders in all wickedness. If truth and decency, and especially anything like Christian character, existed anywhere, they were sure to be found in the respective neighborhoods of some pious ministers of Christ, scattered here and there, who, like glimmering stars in a dark night, were lighting a few humble souls to glory. Time would fail me in entering into those minute details of historical induction which serve to illustrate and confirm our general position. But, if I mistake not, the further we penetrate into the recesses of ecclesiastical history, the more numerous and glaring will be found to be the facts which establish not only the reality, but also the importance of the doctrine which it is my aim to impress upon your minds. Who were the authors of ninety-nine parts, out of an hundred, of that enormous mass of superstition which now forms, and has for ages formed, the contents of that Augean stable which the inspired apostle styles the man of sin, the son of perdition? Beyond all controversy, ecclesiastics, ignorant, deluded, vain, or profligate ecclesiastics with whom have originated all the heresies which, from the birth of Christ to this hour, have corrupted and divided the church, and give rise to some of her most fearful calamities. In almost every instance their authors have been ecclesiastics, philosophical or ambitious ecclesiastics, who have created the most mischievous parties and schisms which have distracted and torn the body of Christ, alienated his ministers from each other, and filled Christendom with the most bitter and unrelenting warfare, a regard to truth still constrains me to say that selfish, proud, turbulent ecclesiastics have been the ringleaders in all the mischief, who have been in almost all cases the haughty and cruel persecutors of the meek, pious, and faithful witnesses of the truth, who have been most active in conducting those of whom the world was not worthy to prison and to death for their fidelity to God and his people. It is painful to repeat the sentence, but it is impossible to avoid still saying ecclesiastics, who can take the most cursory glance at the ecclesiastical history of Great Britain in the seventeenth century without perceiving how possible, nay, how easy it is for a bigoted, proud, and worldly clergy to destroy, in a few years, the spirituality of a church, to banish her most faithful ministers and to cover her with darkness and desolation? And who can study, ever so slightly, the rise, progress, and disasters of the French Huguenots, so conspicuous at one period among the pious followers of the Lamb, without being convinced that the gradual departure of their ministry from the doctrines and spirit of the Reformation was the principal means of drawing down upon them those awful judgments by which a righteous God was pleased to reduce and scatter them, and from which they have never recovered to the present day. On the contrary, 
who have been chiefly instrumental under the divine blessing in accomplishing all the happy reformations which have at any time blessed the church, who have been instrumental in forming new and thriving congregations, in restoring weak and declining ones, in healing ecclesiastical divisions, in promoting happy revivals of religion, in transforming an ignorant, unpolished, and heathen population into an enlightened, orderly, and pious community, in raising the standard of intellect, in promoting the growth of knowledge, in encouraging and regulating the education of youth, in diffusing a spirit of sound morality, in teaching men the rights of conscience and extending a love of civil and religious liberty, in a word, in promoting the reign of truth, order, and happiness in church and state. To these questions, if I mistake not, the voice of history returns a very unequivocal response. In particular, the more closely you scrutinize the history of the Waldenses and Albigenses in remoter periods, and of the Protestant churches of England, France, Geneva, Germany, Holland, Scotland, and New England, in more modern times, the more clearly you will find them to speak a language in perfect harmony with the great principle which I maintain, viz., that no church was ever ruined or essentially injured, but by her own ministers, or signally blessed, but through a revival of their zeal and fidelity. If the foregoing representation be correct, then we may infer, one, that the ministerial office is the most interesting, the most responsible, the most awful under heaven. Every minister of the gospel bears a resemblance to his master in this respect, that he is set for the rise and fall of many in Israel. What he is, the portion of the church with which he is connected, will probably be. Most other people may go through life without exerting such a vital influence both for time and eternity, but on his character, example, spirit, and preaching are continually suspended the everlasting realities of salvation or perdition, and that to an extent which no human arithmetic can calculate. He does not deliver a sermon or take a step or live an hour which may not take hold of heaven or hell. To him the ark of God is committed, and an unhallowed touch may draw down destruction not only on himself but on thousands. Can a candidate for the ministry think of this and not tremble? Is not this a charge weighty enough and momentous enough in its consequences to make even an angel tremble? No wonder that some great and good men have shrunk from the thought of accepting this office out of pure conscientiousness. And let me add that that youth who in contemplating this office does not look forward to it with a sacred awe, who does not sit down and solemnly count the cost of his undertaking, and while he reposes with confidence in the power and faithfulness of his God, does not often ask himself, with the most tender and prayerful solicitude, who is sufficient for these things, discovers but little acquaintance either with his own heart or with the magnitude and awfulness of the trust which he seeks. But while I say this in fidelity to you, my young friends, I must also, in fidelity to my master, say, let no young man who sincerely loves Christ and the souls of men, who earnestly desires the gospel ministry, and to whom the great head of the church opens the regular door of entrance into the office, let no such young man say, the work is so awful that I dare not venture upon it. Of every such youth it may be said, the Lord hath need of him, and for discharging the duties of this high trust he may safely cast himself on the power and grace of him who said concerning his ministers, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 2. From the view which has been taken of this subject we may infer how various, extensive, and difficult of attainment are the qualifications which fit any man to be useful, and especially in any eminent degree useful in the ministerial office. The man who undertakes to instruct hundreds, and perhaps thousands of the learned as well as the ignorant, in the most important of all knowledge. The man who offers himself as an expounder of the Bible, the most difficult book in some respects in the world, to be understood and explained. The man who proposes to act as a spiritual guide to immortal souls, to enlighten the perplexed, to counsel the tempted, to satisfy the doubting, to silence the bold and literary infidel, to refute the learned and ingenious heretic, and to stop the mouth of the artful cavalier, the man who undertakes to be a watchman on the walls of Zion, to discern when danger is approaching, to estimate its nature and magnitude, and to give warning accordingly, the man in a word who is preparing to go forth into the church and the world as an advisor, a guide, and a helper in all that is good, as a center of light and counsel and instruction and consolation and holy activity to thousands, surely such a man ought to have many qualifications which do not belong and are not necessary to common Christians. What various and extensive knowledge, especially what familiar acquaintance with scripture, what deep and ardent piety, what prudence, what knowledge of the world and of the human heart, 
what command of his own spirit, what zeal, what patience, what capacity for labor, what diligence, what perseverance are indispensable here, that no man without unfeigned and even ardent piety ought to engage in the duties of this office is conceded even by those who have no piety themselves. But there may be truly pious men who are, nevertheless, totally unqualified for the ministerial work. No ignorant man, no strikingly weak man, no imprudent man, no habitually indolent man, no rash, headstrong, turbulent, contentious man is fit to be a minister, even if we could suppose him to have the piety of an angel. 3. From the representation which has been given, we may infer that candidates for the holy ministry ought to be in no haste to terminate their preparatory studies and to enter on the active duties of the sacred office. When we reflect on the various attainments and qualifications which are indispensable to the able and faithful discharge of ministerial duties, how much digested knowledge, sacred and profane, how much Christian experience, how much familiarity with Christian casuistry, how much self-command and what long and unwearied labor is to be gone through, not only in storing the mind and the heart with all the requisite ministerial furniture, but also in forming such habits and manners as shall be adapted to promote official usefulness. When we reflect on this, it appears equally wonderful and humiliating that any candidate for the sacred office should imagine that he can be prepared for the pulpit and the pastoral charge in a few brief months after commencing his professional studies. It is difficult to conceive of more deep delusion does not the Apostle expressly prohibit laying hands on a novice? And what is a novice but one who labors under that deficiency in knowledge and practical experience which usually characterize a recent convert? It is impossible for any man, whatever may be his talents, to acquire in so short a time the requisite amount of various knowledge. But even if he could do this, still he ought to be deterred from contenting himself with so hasty and compendious a course." For he has much to gain besides mere knowledge, and much that requires time, toil, and conflict. He is called to study his own heart, to ascertain his own defects and foibles, to discipline his own feelings and habits, to study clerical character under its various aspects, as it is and as it ought to be, to become acquainted with the state and the wants of the church, and, in a word, to lay a deep and broad foundation for every superstructure of intellectual, moral, and spiritual attainment which it is his duty to raise." You no doubt remember that the priests, under the Old Testament dispensation, were not permitted to enter on the public duties of their office until they had reached the age of thirty years. I will not say that under the New Testament economy we ought to be rigidly governed by the same rule, but I can by no means regard with approbation the conduct of some modern candidates for the sacred office who have prematurely pressed into the pulpit at the age of twenty or twenty-one after an extremely hurried and imperfect course of study. I will only say that in ordinary cases nothing can justify such presumptuous haste. No young man, unless his circumstances be very peculiar, ought ever to be licensed to preach the gospel under twenty-four or twenty-five years of age, or to be ordained to the work of the ministry under twenty-six or twenty-eight. Men seldom have, at an earlier age, that deep, steady, enlightened piety, that amount of Christian experience, that maturity of judgment, that established gravity and prudence, that acquaintance with men and manners, and those stores of practical wisdom which are so desirable, even in the first acts of evangelical and pastoral duty. Many a juvenile candidate for the sacred office has entered on his public duties, so strikingly deficient in knowledge, in maturity of judgment, and in practical experience, as to draw a heavy cloud, not only over the outset, but also over the whole course of his professional life. To this source, I have no doubt, we may trace many of those personal indiscretions and theological and ecclesiastical vagaries which have destroyed the usefulness of many a young minister. To this source also, we may trace the early decline of popularity and the disreputable dismission of many a promising young pastor, who, with his sprightliness and confidence, never had a stock of knowledge adequate to the demands of the stated ministry. To this we must ascribe the poor, jejun, and unprofitable preaching of hundreds, who maintain their places and wear the clerical garb. And to this, among other things, we may refer the rashness and the melancholy triumph of zeal over knowledge and wisdom in undertaking to guide the interests of religion in times of extraordinary awakening and revival. The narratives of the unscriptural devices and unskillful management of ministers, pious indeed, but totally lacking in information, experience, and mature wisdom, form some of the most melancholy pages in the history of the Church. 4. If the doctrine on which I have been insisting be correct, then how great is the guilt of unfaithful ministers? 
He who has taken on himself the vows and all the tremendous responsibilities of this office, and yet from indolence or from spiritual indifference neglects the souls committed to his charge, or from a desire to please, flatters and deceives them in the great concerns of salvation, daubing with untempered mortar and crying peace, peace, where there is no peace, incurs a degree of guilt which it is impossible to express or measure. We speak of the thief, the murderer, and the perjured person in civil life with abhorrence, but what is their guilt when compared in the light of God's word with that of the unfaithful minister? The one robs his fellow men of a portion of perishing wealth, the other robs them of all that is precious in the hopes of the soul. The one kills the body, and after that has no more that he can do, but under the murderous hand of the other, the immortal spirit dies and is plunged into the abyss of the damned. The one tramples on a solemn appeal to God about some temporal trifle, the other daily violates oaths and vows, which have for their object the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, and all the mighty interests of thousands throughout an unwasting eternity. A wicked minister is the most wicked of all men. His sins are more extensively and permanently mischievous than those of other men. He sins against greater light and stronger obligations and more solemn engagements than other men, and therefore it appears to me highly probable that the lowest depths in the prison of eternal despair are occupied by unprincipled, unfaithful ministers. And let me ask, is not this peculiar guilt likely to rest with a special weight on such unprincipled and unfaithful ministers as hold an orthodox creed and go down to perdition from orthodox churches? Surely those whose theory is most spiritual, whose profession is most strict, and whose excitements to fidelity are most solemn, incur a proportional degree of guilt in setting them all at naught. If this suggestion be well founded, there are probably no men on earth at this hour whose situation is more responsible and who are called upon more dearly to ponder it in their hearts than the ministers and candidates for the ministry of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. 5. In the light of this subject, we may see why it is that the clergy have been so much despised and made the objects of so much contemptuous sneer in all ages by infidels and worldly men. That assailing and endeavouring to deprecate the character of ministers has long been a favourite method of attacking Christianity itself, both on the part of some who profess to believe it, as well as of open infidels, is well known. The unfairness of this method of attack is indeed manifest. The Bible is our rule of faith and practice, not the character of those who undertake to expound and publish it. Still, however plain and however reasonable this distinction, it is often entirely overlooked. Religion always has been, and ever will be, to a great extent, judged of by her ministers. And alas, that they have, in so many instances, given occasion to the enemy to speak reproachfully. Among the many millions of ministers who have officiated in the sanctuary since the establishment of a visible church on earth, how large a number, with the language of holy exhortation on their lips, have been grossly immoral, how many more, while directing the attention of others to a better world, have manifested that they were selfish, worldly-minded, and supremely devoted to the ambitious pursuits of the present life? Oh, how small has been the proportion in any age or country who have preached and lived as if they really believed the things which they profess to be desirous of inculcating on those around them? The truth is, the great body of the clergy have never acted in character, and therefore no wonder they have been treated with contempt and ridicule. It is not in the nature of things that men so inconsistent should be really respected in their official character. Worldly men sometimes indeed honour ministers who have little apparent piety for their talents, their learning or their attractive social qualities, but they seldom fail to discern their official defects and no doubt are often hardened by them in unbelief and impiety. I freely grant indeed that if ministers were heavenly purity itself embodied, infidels and worldly men would dislike and malign them. When infinite purity was manifest in the flesh, they did cry out, Crucify him, crucify him. Still, however, there is such a thing as the Apostle speaks of when he exhorts Timothy by well-doing to put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Blessed be God, it has been often done, and we may hope that, through his grace, it will be still more frequently done hereafter. If the ministerial character were presented under its genuine, scriptural, and primitive aspect, it would exhort a reluctant homage even from the most abandoned votaries of sin, only let ministers lay aside all worldly policy and habits, let them demonstrate by their conduct that their treasures are in heaven, let them show by their simple scriptural piety, their zeal, humility, purity, meekness, self-denial, and deadness to the world, that the imitation of Christ is their habitual study, and doing good their ruling passion, 
and we shall soon cease to hear of the charge of priestcraft, and the sneer that the clergy of all religions are alike. Too much alike, a great majority of them have, indeed, been in selfishness, indolence, and unfaithfulness to their trust. But the purity of the divine word and the glorious beauty of the Spirit of Christ, by which they profess to be guided, have been ever the same. A sufficient number, too, have been really guided by them to show that, amidst a multitude of counterfeits, there has been much true coin. And the time is coming when the clerical character shall be everywhere so much in harmony with the spirit of the Bible as to redeem itself from every reproach and to be universally acknowledged as a blessing to the world. 6. We may see from this subject why there is so little truly good and profitable preaching. An anonymous writer in a late number of a distinguished foreign journal, remarks that, quote, the eloquence of the pulpit, generally speaking, turns very peculiar advantages to a very moderate account, end quote. Although I have no doubt that my estimate of true excellence in gospel preaching would be found to differ greatly from that of the writer in question, yet the remark just quoted, however humiliating, is doubtless founded in fact. Considering the amount of preaching, and considering, too, the scope, the subjects, the opportunities of leisurely preparation, the excitements, and the almost unlimited field of usefulness furnished to the Christian preacher, I do think the examples of high excellence and of extensive benefit in this department of exertion are wonderfully few and small compared with what might be reasonably expected. It is by no means a sufficient answer to this complaint to say that great talents are extremely rare, and that a very high grade of eloquence in any profession is still more rare. This is no doubt true, and if distinguished genius and first-rate eloquence, measured by the precepts of Cicero, Longinus, or Quintilian, were necessary to form a good preacher, the great majority of clerical men might hold themselves guiltless in being very inferior preachers. But these, however desirable and useful in their place, are far from being necessary to great excellence and eminent usefulness in gospel preaching. A man of enlightened, fervent piety, medium talents, and mature biblical and theological furniture— may preach well, sufficiently well, to be a rich blessing to any community. There is not one of you, my young friends, who, if his heart were warmed and elevated as it ought to be, with living, active piety, and if he took suitable pains to store his mind with appropriate knowledge, might not be a preacher of great excellence and of extensive usefulness. The fire of zeal would supply the lack of artificial refinements, and pour forth a constant stream of eloquence, irregular perhaps, and plain, but truly sanctified, feeling, and therefore impressive in its character. The true reason, then, why we have so little good and profitable preaching is that, among those who attempt to perform this service, there is so little deep, warm, heartfelt piety, and so little of that patient, indefatigable labor to store the mind with knowledge, and to attain an easy, natural, forcible method of communicating it, which are within the reach of most ordinary minds, supremely intent on doing good. Some of the most useful preachers that ever entered the pulpit have been men not at all distinguished either for great genius, profound learning, or striking elocution, but they never fail to be distinguished for good sense, Christian prudence, fervent love for their master's cause, and for immortal souls, and untiring perseverance in holy labor. And rely upon it, whoever will steadfastly exhibit these in any church or country will attain high excellence and great acceptance and usefulness as a gospel preacher. 7. From what has been said, it is evident that while we greatly need a much larger number of ministers, we still more urgently need an increase in ministerial piety, zeal, and fidelity. That there is a real, nay, a most distressing deficiency in the number of laborers employed in the great harvest, in almost every part of our country, every well-informed person knows to be a fact. Taking into view the missionary as well as the pastoral service, it is probably safe to affirm that if we had a thousand able and faithful men added at once to our present number of ministers, they might all be usefully employed. This, I am aware, is doubted by some because they, now and then, find a candidate for pastoral settlement or for some other branch of evangelical service unemployed. But the inference drawn from this fact is undoubtedly delusive. May it not be said of a portion of those unoccupied candidates that they are not worth employing that they are so strikingly deficient in the most important qualifications as to be little, if any better than none, and of the rest, that they are not willing to go where they are pressingly invited and greatly needed, but if some, evidently wanting in the furniture requisite for instructing and edifying the people, and others, not willing to labor where they are called, are standing idle, does either case afford evidence that able, willing, and faithful laborers, and even large additional numbers of them, are not greatly needed? Certainly not. 
Every enlightened friend of religion, then, will pray without ceasing that more laborers may be raised up, qualified, and thrust forth into the harvest. But the friends of piety ought to pray still more earnestly that all who are sent forth may be of the right stamp. It is unspeakably more important that ministers be men of the proper spirit than they be very numerous. Many people appear to speak and act as if it were desirable to obtain a large number of ministers of almost any sort, but truly this is a great mistake. Of what advantage is it to any church to add to her ministry a drone, an ignoramus, or a learned formalist? A thousand such additions to her clerical ranks would do her no good. Good, did I say? The more such ministers are multiplied, the worse it is for the church. They draw down upon her blasting and desolation rather than a blessing. What the church needs is a greater number of pious, humble, enlightened ministers who know how to labor and how to love to labor for Christ and for immortal souls. One such man as Brainerd or Whitfield or Tennant or Martin is worth fifty or a hundred of your cold, timid, indolent men, although they go through a formal round of duties without any disreputable deficiency and preach the truth and nothing but the truth every time they enter the sacred desk. One such man as the Apostle Paul has been and may be again the means of regenerating a nation, while scores or hundreds of men calling themselves ministers are either bloated by sacerdotal pride or paralyzed by frigid indifference, may slumber through their miserable routine for years without witnessing the regeneration of a single soul. 8. We may learn, from what has been said, what that kind of honor is to which ministers of the gospel ought to aspire. Clergymen, in all ages and countries, have unhappily degraded their office while they intended to magnify it. They have sought wealth or secular station, or affected splendor in living, or courted the patronage of great men, or aspired to high rank in the walks of literature, or, if no more elevated honors were within their reach, to occupy the uppermost rooms at feasts, to receive greetings in the markets, and to be called of men rabbi, rabbi. Need I say that all these will be regarded by an ambassador of Christ, who has the genuine spirit of his office, and who wishes with Paul to magnify it, in reality as infinitely beneath his sanctified ambition. That illustrious gospel hero, Martin Luther, was accustomed to say, quote, God will sometimes endure a love of worldly honor in lawyers and physicians, but in ministers of the gospel he will in no case endure it, end quote. Let this sentiment sink down into your hearts with the weight of an incontrovertible maxim. History has undoubtedly set upon it the stamp of truth. Every effort that ministers make in secular aspirings and every step they gain in secular greatness, though it may not bring upon them the visible judgments of the Almighty, will assuredly diminish their zeal, reputation, and usefulness in the sacred office, and if indulged to a considerable extent, will effectually destroy them all. The true honor of a minister of reconciliation lies in possessing all the qualifications proper for his official work, and in devoting them supremely and unceasingly to the advancement of the Redeemer's kingdom. The servant of Christ never miscalculates more egregiously than when he undertakes to be a competitor for worldly titles, places, or distinctions of any kind. The more entirely he is withdrawn from the world, the more perfectly he lives above it, and the more completely he is absorbed in the great work of seeking the salvation of men, the more wisely he consults his reputation as well as his duty and his happiness. Let Lord Bolingbroke and the thousands of nominal Christians who, though they reject the name of infidel, have the same spirit, let them sneer at what he sometimes calls the sublime passion for saving souls. It is a sublime passion, the most sublime that can actuate the bosom of a mortal. It was this that brought the Saviour from heaven. The highest honor of a minister consists in doing good. His noblest laurels are conversions. The best eulogium that can be pronounced upon him is that which was passed on a minister in primitive times. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added to the Lord. 9. If the leading doctrine of this lecture be correct, then there is nothing, humanly speaking, more urgently needed for promoting the best interests of the Redeemer's kingdom in the United States than that the clergy as a body should possess a proper spirit and be fully roused to the faithful discharge of their momentous duties. When we deliberate about plans for promoting the great cause of truth and piety, we are apt to talk of almost all other means, excepting precisely those which are most radical and essential. We speak much of helping the cause forward by funds and societies and annual sermons and multiplying auxiliary associations and making eloquent addresses at annual meetings and a variety of such popular means. Of all these, I most cordially approve, as highly useful in their respective places, 
But I will venture to say we need nothing so much, so far as instrumental agency is concerned, as that the body of Christ's ministers among us be fully awakened to a sense of their obligations and their duties, and embark with humble dependence on their master and with their whole hearts in their appropriate work. Until this shall, in some degree, take place, even supposing all the wealth of the world to be put at the disposal of the church, the work of bringing men under the genuine influence of the gospel will go tardily on. But until this take place, adequate funds for carrying on this great work cannot be furnished, for until ministers be previously imbued with the proper spirit, we must not expect our churches to be roused to that state of spiritual sensibility and exertion which is indispensable and which will one day be realized. It would be a strange phenomenon, indeed, to see the churches going beyond their leaders in knowledge, feeling, zeal, and effort. As reasonably might we expect to see armies pressing forward to conquest and triumph when their officers timidly refused to lead them, or were ignobly slumbering in the rear. A larger number of the ministers of the Presbyterian Church in the United States, for I will not speak of any other church, are fully awake and on the field of battle, properly armed and accoutred, and with the spirit of good soldiers of Jesus Christ burning in their bosoms, I dare not venture to estimate that all are not so, that all are not engaged to the extent of their strength in instructing, rousing, and leading on the sacramental host of God from grace to grace and from victory to victory is a melancholy fact too evident to be denied by the most careless observer. When this desirable state of mind and of habit shall be realized with respect to the great body of them, then the time, even the set time to favor Zion, will have come, then shall the signal be given for the whole body of our population to come up, willingly and efficiently, to the help of the Lord against the mighty, for that the mass of our professing people have not made higher attainments in Christian feeling and Christian effort, that they have not more knowledge of truth, more piety, more zeal, more comprehensive views of the deplorable state of the world, more deep sympathy for the destitute and the perishing, and a more active spirit of benevolent exertion for enlightening the world, I hold to be more owing to a defect of zeal on the part of the clergy themselves than to any other single cause next to the native depravity of the human heart. If the great body of our ministers were thoroughly imbued with the apostolic spirit and animated to a corresponding tone of habitual exertion, we should soon witness glorious days in our beloved country. 10. Finally, in the views which have been taken of this subject, you, my young friends, may find much matter for serious personal application, the great office, the awful office, which we have been contemplating, the office on which so much depends in reference to unnumbered millions, for soul and body, for time and eternity, this is the office which you seek, for which you have come hither to prepare, to which all your studies and intercourse here will be or ought to be directed. Solemn undertaking, momentous enterprise. Oh, if you could foresee the unutterable consequences which will result from this enterprise to yourselves and to all the multitudes whom you may in the course of your lives approach and influence, the present would be an hour of deep solemnity with every one whom I address. May the Lord give you grace to ponder well in your hearts what you are about and what is before you. May the Lord give you grace to consider seriously the furniture which you need for this mighty work, especially that deep, ardent, active piety which lies at the foundation of all other useful furniture. You need, it is true, other attainments, and much of other attainments, but without this you will be of little use as ministers of Christ. Without this, directing, warming, animating, and sanctifying all your other accomplishments, they will be as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Think, I pray you, what a day it is in which the head of the church has cast your lot, no preceding generation of ministers ever saw such a day as this. Such openings for usefulness, such calls to exertion, such multiplied and extensive fields whitening to the harvest, such abundant and potent means for doing good to mankind. To live now is a talent put into your hands for which you must give an account. Have you an ardor of piety, a tone of moral sentiment, a spirit of enterprise corresponding with this day? If not, give yourselves no rest till you in some good measure attain them all. If an ancient heathen rhetorician in giving directions for the attainment of the sublime in writing could say, quote, spare no labor to educate your soul to grandeur and to impregnate it with great and generous ideas, end quote. Much more may the same language be addressed to a candidate for the gospel ministry in the present state of the church's progress. Take unceasing pains to get large views of ministerial furniture, ministerial duty, and ministerial success. Strive to educate your souls to grandeur of conception and grandeur of wishes and hopes and enterprise for the moral benefit of your fellow men. Aim high. Let no petty plans satisfy you, either as to acquirement or exertion. 
Every one of you, however humble his talents, if really disposed to make the most of what God has given him, might cause his influence to be felt to the ends of the earth. Think further what a weight of responsibility, if you live to sustain it, will devolve upon you. When I see more than a hundred theological students before me, amounting to nearly a thirteenth part of the whole number of our ministry, and recollect that in a little time the reins of ecclesiastical administration will drop from the hands of those who now bear them, and who, alas, have so much reason to mourn over the defective manner in which they have borne them, and that a large part of the weighty trust will devolve on you, I can scarcely express my emotions. Is it so, my young friends, that this beloved church, this truly primitive and apostolic church, this church for which our fathers have prayed and labored so much, this church which, though repeatedly involved in the flame of controversy and trial, yet, like the burning bush at Horeb, has not been consumed, but has been mercifully brought forth more thrifty and flourishing, this church, in the future destiny of which the peace, edification, and eternal welfare of so many myriads are involved, is soon to be committed under God to your management, associated with those who in other places are like yourselves training up for the work. And is it true that so much under God depends upon your spirit, attainments, and character, that what you shall be fifteen or twenty years hence the Presbyterian Church will be? Oh, then, gird up the loins of your minds, be sober, and watch unto prayer. Let a sense of your incalculable responsibility daily rest upon you. Let it impel you in your studies, give new fervor to your devotions, and impart a deeper tone of solemnity to all your intercourse, both with one another and with all around you. Remember, in going out and in coming in, in sitting down and in rising up, that you are consecrated men, bound to live and to die for the Church of God. Cultivate a deep and habitual spirit of prayer, covet earnestly the best gifts, and shrink from no labor, either in study or in self-denial, that will prepare you to perform with more efficiency your master's work. Consider no sacrifice as too great for the promotion of the Redeemer's kingdom. Set up no banner in any case but that of Christ. Let all carnal ambition, pride, envy, contention, and unhallowed emulation be put away from among you. Be always ready to surrender every personal feeling for the sake of brotherly love and edification. Cherish more and more the feelings of a holy brotherhood pledged to Christ and to one another by indissoluble ties. Remember that united you will stand and by the spirit and strength of Christ can do all things, but that divided you must fall, and that in every fall of the Christian ministry the cause of the Redeemer bleeds and mourns, Resolve that, if the church be corrupt with error, agitated by controversy or torn by schism, the sin shall not lie at your door. If her walls be broken down by folly or wickedness, see that you be found in the breach, fighting and praying for her restoration. And if ever a time should come in which you can do nothing more, at least be found weeping between the porch and the altar, saying, Spare thy people, O Lord, bless thy heritage, save them and lift them up forever. But if you are faithful, my young friends, such a time will never come. Yes, if only the little band, now seated within the sound of my voice, should all happily prove to be animated with the spirit of the primitive heralds of the cross, there is no presumption in saying that you alone under God would form a pledge to our beloved Church of her spiritual prosperity. The God of all grace grant that you may act a part more worthy of the sacred office than we who have preceded you have ever done. May he preside over your studies, endow you with all those gifts and graces which will fit you for the faithful performance of his great work, and form you to be chosen vessels for building up his church, and bearing the treasures of his love to a dark and miserable world, and to his name be the glory. Amen. End of section 5section 6 of the importance of the gospel ministry by samuel miller this librivox recording is in the public domain note a few remarks on the distinction between the clergy and the laity which it was not convenient to introduce into the body of the lecture it is deemed proper to present in this place it is impossible to read the acts of the apostles and the several epistles especially those to timothy and titus and to examine in connection with these the writings of the apostolic fathers without perceiving that the distinction between ministers of religion and private Christians was clearly made from the very origin of the Christian church and uniformly maintained. That the terms clergy and laity were not used at first is of no importance in any view, since the distinction intended to be expressed by them has undoubtedly and uniformly existed from the commencement of the New Testament dispensation to the present day. The titles of rulers in the house of God, ambassadors of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God, bishops, elders, 
shepherds, ministers, etc., as distinguished from those to whom they ministered, are so familiar to all readers of the New Testament that further elucidation of the point is altogether unnecessary. The word kleros properly signifies a lot, and as the land of Canaan was divided among the Israelites by lot, the word, in process of time, came to signify an inheritance. In this figurative or secondary sense, the term is evidently employed in 1 Peter 5 verse 3. Under the Old Testament dispensation, the peculiar people of God were called, Septuagint translation, his kleros, or inheritance. Of this we have examples in Deuteronomy 4 verse 20 and chapter 9 verse 29. The term in both these passages is manifestly applied to the whole body of the nation of Israel as God's inheritance or peculiar people. Clemens Romanus, one of the apostolic fathers, speaking of the Jewish economy and having occasion to distinguish between the priests and the common people, calls the latter leku. Clemens Alexandrinus, towards the close of the second century, speaks of the apostle John as having set apart such persons for clergymen, kleru, as were signified to him by the Holy Ghost, and in the writings of Tertullian, Origen, and Cyprian, the terms clergy and laity occur with a frequency which shows that they were then in familiar use. Jerome observes that ministers are called clerici, either because they are peculiarly the lot and portion of the Lord, or because the Lord is their lot, that is, their inheritance. Hence the learned and pious father takes occasion to infer, quote, that he who is God's portion ought so to exhibit himself that he may be truly said to possess God and to be possessed by him. End quote. Epistle 2, Ad Nepotian, 5. Others have thought that in giving this title some regard was had to the ancient custom of electing persons into sacred offices by lot. And as we have abundant evidence that ecclesiastical men were familiarly called clerici, or clergymen, from the second century, so we have the same evidence that this term was employed to designate all ecclesiastical men, that is, all persons who had any public employment in the church were called by the common name of clerici, or clergymen. It was applied continually to elders and deacons as well as to bishops or pastors. Nay, in the third century, when not only prelacy had crept in and obtained a general prevalence, but when the same spirit of innovation had also brought in a number of inferior orders, such as subdeacons, readers, acolyths, etc., these inferior orders were all styled clerici. Cyprian, speaking of a subdeacon and also of a reader, calls them both clerici. The ordination of such persons, for it seems they were formally ordained, he calls ordinationes clerici, and the letters which he transmitted by them he styles litere clerici. The same fact may be clearly established from the writings of Ambrose, Hilary, and Epiphanius, and from the canons of the Council of Nicaea. Indeed, there seems reason to believe that in the 4th and 5th centuries, and subsequently, the title of clerici was not only given to all the inferior orders of ecclesiastical men, but was more frequently applied to them than to their superiors, who were generally addressed by their more distinctive titles. Those who recollect that learning during the Dark Ages was chiefly confined to the clergy, that few, excepting persons of that profession, were able to read and write, and that the whimsical privilege commonly called benefit of clergy, grew out of the rare accomplishment of being able to read, will be at no loss to trace the etymology of the word clerk, clericus, or secretary, to designate one who officiates as the reader and writer of a public body. To distinguish the mass of private Christians from the clergy, they were designated by several names. They were sometimes called lecu, laiki, layman, from laos, populus, sometimes Idiote, private men, from Idios, privatus, see Acts 4, verse 13, sometimes Viotiku, seculars, from Vios, which signifies a secular life. Soon after the apostolic age, common Christians were frequently called Andres Ecclesiasticu, men of the church, that is, persons not belonging either to Jewish synagogues or heathen temples or heretical bodies, but members of the Church of Christ. Afterwards, however, the title Ecclesiastics became gradually appropriated to persons in office in the church. See Stephani Thesaurus, Bingham's Origines Ecclesiastici, Book 1. End of Section 6. End of The Importance of the Gospel Ministry by Samuel Miller.